I'll talk to you today about the unknown God of Christmas. Uh, we're going to start in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Christmas has lots of superstitions to it. The story of Santa Claus, and he goes around in one night, you know, and he lives up in the North Pole, and he gives presents to children, and he knows if they've been good or bad. You know, the reindeer pulling them Rudolph out front and all this other stuff. And of course, there's many other traditions and things that are quite superstitious with this Christmas time of the year. But a lot of people associate Christmas with the birth of Jesus Christ. And they believe that they're worshiping Jesus, but they're actually quite ignorant as to who Jesus Christ is. That's the point of this video. I am going to declare to you out there who ignorantly worship Jesus Christ, you do these things to a God that you don't really know. You think that you're celebrating the birth of Jesus. I'm going to show you what the scriptures say about who Jesus really is. And uh, I'm going to declare to you the unknown God of Christmas. First and foremost, Jesus is not a baby anymore. Think about a way in a manger, no crib for his bed, the little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. There's all kinds of little songs. You see the nativity scenes. You see the little baby Jesus laying there. People like to think about that. But they don't like to think about what Jesus Christ is today. But let's look at the scriptures. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 12 says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It did happen. It is a real event. It isn't just some magical story about a mythological man that once lived. Jesus was born. A little over 2,000 years ago, or nearly, you know, we don't really know with the calendars. If they're not, they've been messed with and whatever. But the point is, 2,000 or so years ago, approximately, Jesus Christ was born. But what is he today? Revelation chapter 1, verse 13 through 18 says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, Jesus in other words, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, <clears throat> I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Clearly speaking about Jesus Christ, he's called the Son of Man, and it says there, I am he that liveth and was dead. All right? It's talking about Jesus Christ, the resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ. But most people don't think of him that way. Here you have him, he has his hair is white, white like wool or as snow. It's just gleaming white. And his countenance, his, the, the look of him, it's like the sun shining in its strength. How many people think about that Jesus at Christmas time? Not very many. You think about the little Lord Jesus there, the little sweet baby in the manger. You don't think about him as the glorified risen Lord of glory. Secondly, Jesus Christ is not a white man and Jesus Christ is not a black man. He was a Shemitic Jew. Let me show you the scriptures. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. And one of the elder, elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And so the wicked black Hebrew Israelite movement and the wicked white British Israelism and, and Roman Catholicism as well, they say, well, you see the Jews there, the Judah and the root of David there, that's actually a reference to our people. 
not to the Jews. Uh, that's false. Uh, the Jews are in Israel. Okay, and I'm not saying everybody that lives in the, in the country of Israel is, is all bloodline Jew. I understand that. There are fakes that have moved there and whatever else. But uh, you can tell the difference between a white man, a black man, and a Jew. A real one. John chapter 1 verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Look at this. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Who did Jesus Christ come to minister to? He came to minister to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people. Okay? Um, they weren't black, and they weren't white. More on that here in a couple of minutes. Acts chapter 17, verse 29. You say, but I, I think that they were. Then you have a big problem. Because the New Testament says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. The paintings that you see of Jesus are actually violations of Scripture. They are sin. They are graven images. Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Graven images are condemned in the pages of of the King James Bible. You're not supposed to make a graven image of Jesus. I mean, do you really think when he was here on the earth that he actually would stop and pose to have somebody paint him? Hmm. And most of the paintings of Jesus showed up hundreds of years after his death, burial and resurrection. I don't think Jesus posed for paintings. You say, what does Jesus look like? We don't know. But I know what his race was when he was here on the earth. He was a Jew. He wasn't this guy here, the white Jesus, and he was not this guy here, this black Jesus. Okay, uh, no, neither depiction is correct. You say, what did he look like? We don't know, and I'm not going to show any kind of pictures because that's just a graven image of the Godhead. Jesus Christ is the Godhead, by the way. We'll be getting back to that. Number three, Jesus is not your homeboy. A lot of people try to come out with that type of thing. Jesus is the Lord of glory. Um, he is your friend in the sense of he gives salvation, but he's not your buddy. I mean, John, that we read about there in the book of Revelation, he was the disciple that Jesus loved. He was the beloved disciple. And, you know, at the Last Supper, he had his, he had his head kind of on the chest of Jesus there, you know, leaning back like this on him. Certainly friends. But when he sees Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ, he falls at his feet like he's dead. He's scared to death. And you see that yet you see these modern Christians, the modern churches, and Jesus is just this cool guy, and you'll even see people wearing the t-shirt, Jesus is my homeboy. It's blasphemy. Jesus is the Lord of glory. Let me give you some scriptures. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a, us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of course you'll hear that sung in music around this time of the year. You know, it's pretty amazing there. Uh, he's not just some kind of a little buddy. He's the everlasting Father, the mighty God. Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 9, 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 through 8 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, knew for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And you know what? The wicked people out there in this world, if they really knew who Jesus was, if they really understand, if they could really perceive that He is the Creator, He sustains their miserable lives, they wouldn't mock Him. You wouldn't crucify Him with your jokes, with taking His name in vain, with coming up with your false religions. If you're lost out there. James chapter 2 verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Again, another reference to Jesus being the Lord of glory. Interesting because it's the angel of the Lord that comes down and announces to these shepherds that there's a baby that's been born. And it says, in the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Remember in Revelation that it's actually... Jesus Christ, His countenance is as it's brighter than the sun, essentially. And you see it all throughout the book of Revelation. His countenance is like the sun. 
And the angel of the Lord came down to announce to the shepherds the birth of Jesus. And the Lord and the glory of the Lord is shown round about him. Very interesting. When you understand what Jesus Christ is, who he is, you'll see that he is the Lord of glory. He is God. God manifest in the flesh. Which brings me to my next point. Number four, Jesus is not the second member of the Trinity. You'll hear that thing among religious circles, particularly the Catholics and false professing Christians. They'll say he's the second member of the Trinity. Uh, well, if you come in second place, then you're not the winner. There's an old saying back when I was a teenager, we rode, I used to ride motocross and things, and they'd say second place is the first loser. Well, if Jesus Christ is the second member of the Trinity, then he's not at the very top. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, a lot of people do that at this time of the year. They don't glorify little baby Jesus for what he really is and who he really was when he was here on the earth. He's God, holy, completely God. And they'll come up with all kinds of little philosophical concepts and whatever else creations of man, like the Trinity concept, appears nowhere in Scripture. And they come up with this little thing, these little lies, and they'll try to explain Jesus away. That he's not fully holy God. He's one of three persons in heaven, each one sharing the title God. It's nonsense. They came up with a false God to try and explain Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Well, when was the Father walking around on the earth? He was when Jesus was here. Jesus is the Father. Unto us a son is born, or a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Are you sure, sure you know who Jesus is? Hmm. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The world doesn't know who the Father was. It knew him not. He's on the earth walking around in Jesus Christ. Body, soul, spirit, you see. Get back to that in a minute. Verse 9, for in him, Christ, in other words, all the fullness of the Godhead, or excuse me, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is God, holy, completely God. Do you know Jesus? Are you sure? 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Man is made in the image of God. Man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Three separate things. If we're made in the image of God, then God has to have a body, a soul, and a spirit. It's very easy. It works out very simply. Jesus Christ is the body. He's the physical body that died, that was born as the little baby Jesus in the manger that laid in the manger, the shepherds came and spoke to him. But while he's laying in the manger, the angel of the Lord is there speaking to them and they see the glory of the Lord. Hmm. It's not two different Jesuses. It's not two different beings. It's just bodies there in the manger. Soul is there speaking to them. And then the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. Hmm. Number five, Jesus is not a fictional character. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? 
You say, wait a second, wait a second. This prophecy that Jesus gave turned out to be false because you see the Jews over there, they're, they bow to the, the wailing wall and there's this big wall with all these big stones where their temple once stood. That's not the site of their temple. And a real Jewish scholar will tell you that. That's not where the temple was. That was Fort Antonia, a Roman fort. But see, the Jews have to cover up for the fact that their temple was destroyed and there's no stone standing anymore at that temple mount because they have to deny the words of Jesus Christ. They didn't receive Him as their Messiah, and they still don't receive Him as their Messiah, but they will one day after the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming up to punish that nation of Israel. But they, when Jesus is dying on the cross, they say, we have no king but Caesar. And guess what? They still believe that. And there's going to come a covenant between the papists, the Roman Catholic Church, in other words, and the nation of Israel to wipe out Islam. That's what the covenant is there that gets confirmed in Daniel chapter 9. There's no peace treaty between the Jews and the Muslims. Sorry, John Hagee. Sorry, Tim LaHaye. Sorry, any of these other false teachers. That's a lie. It doesn't say anything at all about Jews and Muslims back in Daniel chapter 9. And all these people waiting to see the peace treaty between the Jews and the Muslims in Israel are going to wait till it's never going to happen. Okay? It's the Catholics. They've already signed agreements between the Vatican and Israel. See, the Vatican has claims to the city of Jerusalem. That's their fort that the Jews are there bowing to those stones. So the Vatican has real estate there. And you can get into the whole thing of the, the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre there with the Knights of the Equestrian Order and all the other things that go on over there in Jerusalem. The Catholics have holdings there. And the Jews do too. And you see, Jesus Christ predicted all this stuff. So if he was a fictional character, how could he predict all these things and they're coming to pass? But it doesn't end there. Let's keep going. His disciples came and said, What are the signs of the end of the world and of thy coming? Verse 4, Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Is there deception today among organized religion? Yes. A whole lot of deception. And it's ironic because every single Catholic priest out there actually, according to Catholic doctrine, is another Christ. You can look it up. It's in the Catechism. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Are there wars and rumors of wars? You say, well, that's always been. That's always been there. How about world wars? Have there ever been world wars before where atomic Weapons were used. You say World War II. You know that the 20th century was the bloodiest century in all of history, all of recorded history. Millions, millions of people being killed and slaughtered. I mean, just in, in Russia, communist Russia, with 60 million people slaughtered with all the communist things. Communist China, over 100 million. Just two countries. You take Nazi Germany, you take uh, World War I Germany and things, and all these... Just millions, 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 millions just losing their lives. Wars and rumors of wars. You say, well, that was back then, but things are looking better now. Uh, no, they're not. And there will be nuclear war in the future, and there will be a lot more people that die. Guarantee you. You know why? Jesus said so. That's why. Are you thinking about that this Christmas season? Is that a topic of discussion at your Christmas parties? Or would you rather talk about Santa Claus and what you got at the store? Hmm. Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. It's amazing. Earthquakes are just in, on the increase all the time. And they try to say, the U.S. Geological Survey tries to say, well, that's because it looks like it's increasing, but we didn't have the instruments to monitor that back long ago. So the, it's not really increasing. It's just we have better equipment now. Sure, sure. Then why is it that buildings that have stood for centuries all of a sudden are being destroyed by earthquakes? Hmm. There's always been so many earthquakes. I don't think so. 
Earthquakes are on the increase. Why? Because the unknown God of Christmas said so. You see, if he's God, he'll be able to, he's not confined to when he lived on the earth. He can tell you what happened in the past, what's happening when he's here on the earth, and what will happen in the future. And he does. Muhammad? Nope. He's not going to give you any kind of accurate prophecies or anything like that. Not on the level that Jesus Christ did. You know, he's a fool. Buddha? No. Any of the popes? I don't think so. Jesus Christ isn't like the others. Number six, Jesus is not going to bring in world peace. You'll hear that. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. You know, Jesus will bring world peace. And we can experience this at Christmas. We can have this warm, togethering, together feeling with everybody kind of joins together and, and we all hug and embrace. And this is the time when we can have peace in our homes. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. You know, sure, but it starts out with glory to God in the highest. Do you give glory to God in the highest at this time of the year? Hmm. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 36. Think not, this is Jesus speaking here. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. 100% of the time that I, every Christian I've ever met, every born again new creature in Christ Jesus, not false church going Christians, every truly born again Christian has problems with their family. Every single time. I have never met one genuinely born again Christian that gets along with everybody. Never. You see somebody that says, I'm a Christian and everybody loves me and I get along with everybody else, they're on their way to hell. I promise you. You say, well I, well, I don't know about that. Or you'd want to deny the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm come to set families against each other. Guaranteed. It has to be that way. Are you willing to have uh, problems at the holiday season? I'm not saying you shouldn't celebrate Christmas. I'm not saying you can't uh, you know, get some things for your children or whatever else. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. That's fine. Absolutely fine. But if you think that it's a time that you can get along with everybody, it's a problem. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 13 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon uh, him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Jesus Christ is coming to judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Hmm. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And he's coming in righteousness to judge and make war. Is that the God that you think about when you celebrate Christmas? Number seven. Jesus is not the founder of Catholicism. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says, And I say unto thee, this is Jesus speaking, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, and the Catholics will say, Well, see, Jesus built the church on Peter. Well, that's a real problem because just a few verses later, Jesus is calling Peter Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't build the church on Peter. Say, so how do you know? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is the Apostle Peter. Pope Peter I. No, it says, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation that the church is built on. And there is no such thing as apostolic succession. That is a pagan myth. You say, well, I, I go to the Catholic Church every Christmas, and I give my money in the offering plate, and I go to my Protestant church, and I go to my Baptist church, and I go to whatever church, and we, we can trace ourselves back through the apostles. And nonsense. Nonsense. You can have Jesus Christ as the foundation of your faith today. And you don't need some organized religious church to be part of and be a faithful member and whatever else there to get to heaven when you die. More on that later. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ, not Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. He's not talking about Peter. He's talking about himself. He's the foundation that the church is built on. So how do we conclude this? Well, what is the most important part about the Christmas season? What are things that you can celebrate? Um, you can say, you know, the color's red and green. If you study it, when John gets up to heaven in the book of, of Revelation, chapter 4, uh, we're reading it in our family devotions right now, and literally just read it last night, and John sees one that sat upon the throne, and he's like a jasper and sardine stone that's red. Red. And then he says that there's an emerald, there's a rainbow behind the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Green. Red and green. Hmm. What color are the northern lights? Red and green, predominantly. Um, where is the throne of God? In the sides of the north, according to Isaiah chapter 14. Hmm. There's a lot of things about the, uh, some things within the Christmas season that have a pointing towards things in the Bible, pointing towards things in eternity. You say, what's going on there? Well, it's kind of like what Paul saw there with the uh, altar, with the inscription, to the unknown God. A lot of people do this. A lot of people have the Christmas celebration, but it's to an unknown God. But you see, I'm here to declare that unknown God to you. You see, you can't just come and say, I believe by faith in the little baby in the manger. Oh, he's so cute. He's so adorable. But I don't really want to hear about the Jesus that's coming back. The one whose brightness is above the countenance, or whose countenance is above the brightness of the sun. I don't want to hear about that one. I like the Jesus that says, peace on earth and goodwill toward men. I like that. I like to hear that. But I don't want to hear about the judgment and the righteousness and the war that comes. If you want to accept Jesus Christ, you need to accept him as it's written in the scriptures, not according to your church denomination, not according to what your family thinks and whatever else. You want to accept Jesus? Your family's going to turn against you. You want that this holiday season? Hmm. But what is the gift? See, that's really what Christmas is all about to us and to many people. It's about the thing of giving a gift to someone that you love. You wait and you wait and you wait for that Christmas morning when you can say, here's the gift I bought for you. Here's the special thing that I, I knew you've always wanted this or whatever else. That, to me, is the special part of Christmas. A Santa Claus, scrap that junk, whatever else. Uh, going into all kinds of debt and whatever and, and a lot of the other superstitious types of things of Christmas. Uh, eh, no, I don't waste time on that. But I like to think about the collars of God's throne. And I like to think about something like a a tree like this, it's an evergreen, kind of like everlasting life. I like to think about those things, but I like the gift that a father gives to his son most of all. Let me tell you about that gift. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift is available. God has a gift for you. And it's not just Christmas Day, it's any day of the year. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You don't have to work for the gift that God has for you. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. When you get saved, then God will, he has ordained special good works that you're supposed to walk in those. Why? Because it's profitable. It's a good thing. I don't mean you're going to make a lot of money. I don't mean that by profitable. I mean, if the Lord says, hey, clean up that alcohol out of your life. You know what? Instead of sitting at home getting drunk this Christmas, get saved. Come to the Lord and, and get saved and let the Holy Spirit of God start to clean up your life. Alcoholism will lead to cirrhosis of the liver. It'll lead to all kinds of other problems. It's terrible for you. You get into drunkenness and whatever else, you fall down, you get in car accidents, you lose your license, all kinds of bad things. Let the Lord clean up your life. You say, well, I should probably clean up. i got to quit this stuff. No, 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 no. 
Come to the Lord as a sinner. The gift is available for you. This Christmas season, get yourself something really nice, like eternal life. And then God can come in and change your life after that. That's the beauty of the true gift of God that He has. It isn't just, well, you get to go to heaven when you die and go ahead, just go on back to your life. God will fix up the most miserable, wretched sinner. God will take the most miserable, wretched sinner. There's nobody out there that God would receive, or excuse me, refuse the gift of salvation. All He wants from you is that you come to Him as a sinner. That's all. That's it. You get the gift. You say, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. The gift's not for you. Well, I go to church. Not for you. I worship the little baby in the manger. Hey, I helped set up the nativity scene at the town square. This year. gift's not for you. I believe that we're going to have world peace, and I'm doing my best to, to work in the community, and, and I think that we're going to have a real good time in the future. The gift's not for you. The gift of God is there to anybody that comes in a repentant, broken state and that says, God, I'm a sinner. And if I had to stand before you right now, if I die today and I stand before you, I'm not going to get into heaven. And I don't have any money to, that I can give you. I couldn't pay you off or something like that. I, I have nothing that I can do. And the Lord says, I have a gift for you. How would it be if you came down Christmas morning and there's all these gifts underneath there and you see one with your name on it and it has a price tag. Is that a real gift? No. You get the gift. It's given to you. Right? That's how it is with the Lord. There's no price that you can pay in anything like that. All you got to do is just come to Him in a broken state. Just say, I need the gift. A lot of people don't think that they need the gift. Life is good. Life is fine. You're not going to get to heaven without that gift of God. And I pray you take care of it. Don't go another year. Don't go another Christmas season understanding a father giving gifts to a child. Understanding that God the Father wants to give you a gift. The gift of, his, of eternal life. Don't go another year without receiving His gift. You know, again, let me give you another little story to think about. You come down and you've gotten some really nice gifts for some people that you care very much about and you want them to have that gift. And they come and they look at it and they say, nah, I don't want that. It doesn't impress me. I'm not interested in that gift that you want me to have. No thank you. And they walk away. Would it hurt your feelings a little bit? You say, that hurt my feelings very much. If somebody refused the gift that I paid for, well, uh, how do you think God feels when you refuse His gift of salvation? I pray that you get that thing figured out between you and God. I didn't say you got to join my church or whatever else or send me 10% of your income or anything like that. That's all man-made stuff. Okay? You can watch other videos on that. Um, what I'm trying to get you to do is I'm trying to get you to work out your relationship between you and God. You don't even have to talk to me. You don't have to ever let me know or anything else between you and God. And this is the book that will tell you about it. King James Version. Don't accept any others. They're fake. King James Version. Right here. Get the best book out there for the English-speaking world. So that's going to be it. I do pray that you take these things to mind. Um, the vast majority of people that think they understand Jesus Christ, the God of Christmas... No, actually, He's the unknown God of Christmas. Uh, the scriptures that I gave you today, you will never hear them in a Christmas service, Christmas Eve service, Christmas cantata, Christmas program on TV. You'll never hear them. They don't want to talk about that God. They don't want to talk about the Lord of glory. Jesus is the little baby that lays in the manger. Look how helpless and how cute and everything else He is. That's not Jesus. I pray you get to know the real Lord Jesus Christ today. Thank you for watching.